Okay, hi, good afternoon everyone. Thank you again for joining us for this week's DDU teaching uh, from the PN Hospital in Sydney. Uh, Benny Samadhi, uh, thank you again, is going to be teaching us uh, about LVOT obstruction. It's a really important topic, uh, I think, in just the general care of the critically ill patient. Uh, and again, it's something that's very commonly asked about in exams. I think from the DDU perspective, it's asked a lot because of its clinical relevance, and if you miss it, it's a big deal in my opinion. So thanks very much indeed. I'll, I'll hand over to Benny. Thank you again for doing the teaching. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so um, I've got on the on the first slide just a couple of things, a couple of references that you might want to um, look at yourselves. This sort of structured the talk around these guys, and then right at the bottom is a 2010 paper by Fagenbaum. You might recognise the name. He's written some echo textbooks. It's actually on M mode, but it's it's an amazing paper. It's just basically spot diagnoses from M mode. So I really recommend that when you get some free time to have a look at that. Um, okay, so before we go straight into left ventricular output tract obstruction, I thought we'd just take a step back and talk a little bit about hypertrophy. Because um, that's kind of the, the, the classic LVOT obstruction kind of uh, diagnosis hinges on a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, later. So, um, so to make that diagnosis of, um, of, of a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you actually have to have 15 millimeters is the cutoff, and it can be in any segment. So it's not uncommon to get uh, just one, uh, the, the, the basal septal um, segment being hypertrophied, like that little nubbin you see is quite common in elderly people. So that could, that could be classified as a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy just by itself, just in that one segment. And that can cause some LVOT obstruction as well. Um, it's important to recognize that there's other reasons why uh, the left ventricle will, will look quite thick and chunky, and it, that's um, hypertrophy from other reasons. The main, com well, the common one is hypertension. So with hypertension, you would expect it to be quite a uniform hypertrophy, quite uh, concentric. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about um, hypertroph hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is that when you do a strain analysis, and you can see this actually, so on your parasternal long axis, uh, the contraction is quite good. It looks normal. And then when you do your strain in the four chamber, um, in the apical four chamber view, that's impaired, maybe not even to our eye, but it is actually impaired. So the first thing that goes is longitudinal contraction. And is that because there's some kind of ischemia that's associated with it? Because I classically talk about the longitudinal stuff being, you know, those in the, the endocardial fibers on the very inside of the, well, the endocardium. Yeah. And they're the ones that are most sensitive to ischemia. Do you think it's because these guys are more prone to the ischemia, therefore? Yeah, possibly. I, I don't know. I haven't actually seen an explanation as oh. to why that is. Um, the interesting thing is that our eye won't pick it up, but strain will. Yeah. So... Um, it might look normal to our eye and then you do the strain and then and specifically again the global longitudinal strain is what's impaired which is what we that's typically what's what's measured the, the yeah. yeah so um so uh what are some of the ways that what are some of the other ways that or maybe you guys could tell me should we unmute sure <laughs> unmute them take maybe. a pick um Who do you uh, want? How about pick a, pick a Lewis? We'll go Lewis, Lewis, Lewis Campbell. Here we'll go, Lewis. Um, so, can you tell me some of the other reasons why you might get hypertrophy? Um, well, uh, so hypertension is the most obvious one, definitely the most common. Um, uh, and then, probably a little bit skewed. So, around here, it's valve disease. So, it would be um, a valve um, disease, um, particularly stenosis classically, although you can get it with um, almost pure regurgitation as well. Um, it could be, um, yeah, I suppose uh, non-compaction 
Um, yeah, very good. I think of things that you've not already listed on there. Um, and infiltration, that would be amyloidosis, I'm, I'm assuming would be the, the, the biggest cause there. Cancers below that. Um, and I don't know anything at all about storage diseases, except for um, there, there's that one that makes you look like a gargoyle. <laughs> yeah, me neither. <laughs> my my mother-in-law has that one. No, I'm kidding, kidding, kidding. You recorded it. You didn't record it. She would watch. <laughs> Um, okay, very good. So yeah, LV non-compaction, very rare, but very cool kind of diagnosis. You can get that in the left ventricle or the right ventricle. There are some um, very specific diagnostic criteria to do with the CRIPS and how long they are and how many. Um, and uh, athlete's heart. So that's quite a difficult one to, to differentiate from uh, a, a, a concentric hypertrophy or a regular hypertrophy. Um, some of the clues to differentiating that one would be uh, they, they don't have diastolic dysfunction if you don't go down the second pathway. Um, it's rarely more than 12 millimeters. So they're hypertrophied, but not um, that severely. Um, and they have a chamber dilation associated with it so that they're, at the chaotic, I mean, it makes sense, right? The chaotic output is actually probably normal or high um, uh, because of that. So it's, a, it's an adaption more than anything else. And um, you mentioned the uh, aortic stenosis, also subvalvular um, mm -hmm. aortic diseases. Uh, and yeah, and that's, that's pretty much all of them. And with um, hypertension, we mentioned differentiating it by, because it should be quite concentric. Um, and uh, again, that's rarely more than 18 millimeters. Uh, whereas with these guys, you can have it um, pretty, pretty thick, very much, much more than that. Okay, so, uh, so there's lots of different types of hyper hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So there's lots of different um, permutations of it, just to be aware of. They, they, they're not that common. The most common one is a basal septal asymmetric hypertrophy I talked about. And that's because that's actually gets quite common with older age. So we see that a lot. Um, and, and they get that sort of sigmoid septum. They get the, the little nubbin next to the um, LVOT and that, that can be associated with LVO2 obstruction. Um, otherwise, you can have other forms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, and uh, they're actually genetic. So there, there might be some gene abnormality associated with those depending on, um, uh, but they're not, um, they don't correlate phenotypically. So you might have the same gene abnormality and get an apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or a reverse septum type, if that makes sense. Uh, and then you have a mid ventricular type and we sort of talked about the others already. Um, does that make sense so far? Any questions? So in the classic, um, so the, 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 the classic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction that we all sort of um, learn about is uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy plus outflow tract obstruction. Um, and that outflow tract obstruction is usually related to the SAM, so systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. There's certain things that will come part and parcel of that, which is MR. And the cutoff is a left ventricular outflow gradient of 30 millimeters of mercury. But they don't really do anything about it until it's above 50. Doing something about it might mean surgery, for example. Uh, the best way to identify the SAM is on M mode. And I'll show you some pictures in a bit. And it's um, in, in prepping for this talk, I realized something. So you have your classic LVOT obstruction. And that's largely actually based on anatomical features like, like what we've just discussed. And then maybe a little bit with, the, with physiological features. So if you can't get that gradient, you can get them to do a Valsalva. So with a little, bit of, a little bit of physiological priming, then they'll develop an outflow tract obstruction. Whereas with the physiological dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, there can be absolutely no anatomical abnormalities associated with that whatsoever and it's mostly a physiological problem so it's kind of a spectrum when you think about it of how much your anatomy takes how much your anatomy plays into it and then how much the physiology plays into it and then at some point you you 
um, you probably have have quite a crossover as well. Both both things happening at the same time. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. But that to mean just if someone's, for example, a lady who's got a septic knuckle, you're not going to see an LVOT obstruction. But when she gets sick with a pneumonia and the RV dilates a little bit because of hypoxia and, and pulmonary vasoconstriction, uh, an increased R RV afterload, and then that pushes the septum over a little bit, then she starts to develop it. Is that what you mean by the physiological side yeah. of things? But so there's still an anatomical there thing. Is, there's still a predisposition, I mean, an yeah. anatomical predisposition. So, yes, yeah, so that would be one example. There are, there's, but there's a significant number of people who develop a dynamic LVOT obstruction with no anatomical abnormalities at all. And Being hypovolemic. Yeah, so, so, they, so they're, 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 they don't have any hypertrophy, they don't have the basal septal hypertrophy, they don't have any valve disease, but because they're super dry, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, all the RVs massive uh, and impinging on the LV and um, they, they can still develop an L, LVOT obstruction. So it, there's both possible. Okay. And I think how much your anatomy plays into it is kind of uh, how much of it is a classic left ventricular alpha tract obstruction at the level of the left ventricular outflow tract. And then how much your physiology plays into it, you can have it any, anywhere in the LV chamber can, can be that obstructive physiology. Okay. And we'll, 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 I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. Uh, and then I think it's just um, um, important to... Um, uh, understand that your, your Doppler alignment is really important. So when you're screening for this and you throw a continuous wave through your left ventricular outflow tract, because you do get an associated MR with this classic type of, with the SAM and the um, uh, a higher LVOT gradients, it's important not to confuse your MR gradient with the LVOT gradient. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Okay, sorry about the crappy uh, <laughs> image quality. <laughs> um, so this is just showing you kind of the um, what uh, what's done to sort of elucidate that gradient. So you can basically you're inducing a, a in somebody who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you're inducing a uh, physiological state. Some of them have resting SAM, but in the rest, you're trying to induce a, a physiological state that will cause an obstruction. And this is a similar um, pathway. Okay. So. Can I just do my phone? And then one yeah, more thing. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the things that you can induce them with when you're talking about the exercise that you can do there in terms of the animal nitrate or the animal nitrate, excuse me, the stress gradient. I do the, um, if they're lying in bed, just get them to cycle in the air. The, uh, that's a good way to induce it. And same thing with the, I think we showed that in the mitral stenosis yesterday as well. Um, okay. <laughs> all right so uh you all know what uh, what this is what, what what are we looking at here it's not a trick question oh we don't know everyone's muted unmute yourselves should we choose uh ray do you want to go <laughs> let's uh, unmute ray we'll work our way down sure so this is an m mode through through a long axis uh personal uh personal long axis view and we're seeing E and A waves that are consistent with mitral uh, movement um, um, uh, uh, in both systole and diastole. I am not actually sure what the arrow is pointing at. Um, that's uh, normal, I think. Yeah, it's I think just it's normal. normal yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so diastole and systole. So presumably that's just systole. Now, now what is the arrow pointing at? What's happening in this one? <laughs> um, so your demonstration of the septal hypertrophy um, with, with the S uh, label there, um, we're seeing um, uh, obstruction, um, so uh, 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 um, systolic anterior motion of the uh, anterior, uh, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, um, causing obstruction in, in systole. Um, yeah. And are there any things in, in that that we might be able to see in M mode or even on the 2D that would tell us how uh, that would point towards the severity of this obstruction? Um, severity of the obstruction. Uh, the earlier closure of the, of the, uh, uh, the tract? Uh, yeah, uh, of the what? Of the outflow tract, the early closure, like the, 
Like yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but on the mitral M mode, is there are there any features we should be paying attention to? Oh, it's, it's a little bit of a thinking question. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm just trying to get to um, the the earlier that leaflet hits the septum, and the longer yeah. it stays in contact with the septum, with yeah. is associated with higher severity. Yeah. I love that question in the ASE exams for those of you who are doing it. So they, they often talk about the length of time. And is the, isn't it over 25% uh, they, sorry, 25% um, of systole? If it's longer oh, yeah. than that, that, that's uh, associated with significance and over a third, it it's, can be very severe. Um, and then this is a, so this one is just, a, again, sorry about the crappy image quality, uh, is, is a more severe form of SAM. Can you all sort of see that? where it's contacting the septum earlier and for a longer phase. Um, okay. So, okay, so what do we, maybe we'll pick on someone else. Thanks, Ray. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Brams, are you okay to go? Uh, oh. So is it, is it okay to ask you a question, Ramsey? Yes. Thank you. So what are we seeing here? If I tell you, that the, um, it's a continuous wave through the LVOT. Yeah, so if you're seeing the continuous wave uh, th through the LVOT, then this is a late peaking uh, um, you know, spectral Doppler, uh, which will signify an, an obstruction along the path of the con continuous wave, um, which could be anywhere from the LVOT till the apex uh, of the LV. Okay, I think you guys know all this stuff already. I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna end it there. <laughs> yeah, perfect, exactly. So late peaking, um, and the the reason for that late peaking is that you get this sort of feedback loop as the the gradients increase throughout um, uh, throughout the cycle, and then you sort of get higher and higher pressures. So that's why it's late peaking. Um, and what do we? See? Oh, sorry. sorry. And what about this one? Um, there is again, I mean, uh, um, there's definitely a late peaking uh, signal there, but uh, you can also see a early um, uh, a spectral Doppler which starts early in systole, which is likely to be uh, MR, uh, given um, the velocity um, and the, the dura the, it starts early in systole. You can see that. I can't see the ECG well, but it looks like it starts somewhere just before the QRS complex. Yeah, so, so which, which one, which arrow, the dotted arrow or the solid arrow, do you think is the LVOT gradient and which one is being, is, is the MR? Yeah, so the MR is the uh, dotted line, uh, the dotted arrow, and uh, the LVOT would be the solid arrow. I actually think so. We're right. Oh, you've got the isovolumetric contraction. Yeah. Really, oh. why, why? Why is that? Oh yeah. So the QRS. Yeah. So yeah. the QRS says that. Yeah. So so to, um, why why is that, buddy? Um. So again, um, the MR um, would start early. Yeah. Um, yes. Earlier in the in in the systole. Yeah. And the LVOT obstruction would be. Um, Speaking later, and uh, uh, also the ejection will happen later. So um, the timing, I think, the LVOT will be um, delayed. And then yeah, and, and why is that? Um, so we're looking at uh, isovolumetric uh, uh, contraction. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, you've got to you've got to generate the pressure in the LV That's before right. the LV valve flicks open. You've got more pressure behind it, right, for it to. Yeah. The flick open, so you've got to generate that pressure. You don't have that for the LA. So the LA, you're going to get the mitral regurgitation happening earlier because of the less of the pressure gradient before you get the, that's where the isovolumetric contraction comes for, before the aortic valve opens or the obstruction starts to occur, and that's when, that's when you get it. Yeah. So yeah, mitral regurgitation first because of isovolumetric contraction. And Lewis, yeah. Sorry, Lewis, just can you on? Sorry, okay, I've got okay, to okay. double it. Um, uh, if it's purely mitral regurgitation because of the systolic anterior motion, wouldn't you need to generate the flow across the 
the LVOT in order to open up the mitral valve to generate it. So that's why we did. But the, um, I think you've still got the pressure. It's all about the, the pressure gradient to get flow, right? And so I think the flow is, you're still going to get the mitral regurge first. So as, as the pressure's building up, you'll be seeing the mitral regurge first before the LVOT obstruction happens. That makes okay. sense. Yeah. It, the mitral regurge in this is usually mid to late systole, though, you're right. Yeah. Okay, that's a difficult one. All right, so um, this is a slide I've uh, ripped off of um, a lecture, who I'll credit in just a second when I remember his name. Okay, so it's basically showing a check. So if you can, if you know, um, so if you've got your mitral regurge trace, you can actually estimate the pressure, the LALV gradient from the mitral regurge trace. So if you're confusing it, you're not really sure if there's, there's a gradient across the LVOT, you can do a check and balance. So if you get your gradient across the, the, um, uh, across the LALV with the mitral regurge, and say in this example is 5.9 meters per second, and then you use that to work out what the pressure gradient is. Um, you assume an LAP, uh, left atrial pressure, uh, of 15 if you don't know, or um, if you can figure it out um, uh, from the diastolic studies, or from your diastolic measurements. And then you have uh, a blood pressure. So if you know their systolic blood pressure, then you can actually work out what the gradient is across the LVOT. So you have an LAP of 15, you have a gradient, an LALV gradient of 139. So that means your LV pressure is 154. And then if you have a blood pressure of 120 systolic, that means that your LVOT gradient is 34. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you can sort of do a, a check. So that would be significant. It wouldn't be significant to do any, enough to do anything about it, but it would be, it would class, it, it, you could call it an LVOT obstruction because the gradient is high enough. Okay. Um, okay, so what do we have here? Oh, we don't have any, who am I gonna pick on? Harvey Bay, Harvey Bay. Okay, hi Harvey Bay. What is this showing us? I'm going to have to defer that to the DDU examiner in the room. <laughs> 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 I've been enjoying it. This is Richard. <laughs> I've no idea. I'm sorry. I've got I don't even <laughs> what, uh, can you guys see it well enough? Uh, what, what's the, what's the colour Doppler image of? Like, what view have we got there? So, baseline here is right at the top so we're not getting to see any profile through diastole and we can see this starting at the very early on in the QRS so we could question whether or not there is a component of MR but that very late peak there would be more consistent there's a bit of turbulence on the 2D image here through the outside track which would be suggestive of that being uh, a subalveolar obstruction and you might elucidate that further by other mechanisms that they might chat about all the time. Nice. Very good. Excellent. <laughs> we have one and a half years. We have felt like seven and a half years. Um very good. And what do you think of the shape of that curve? I don't know. I, I know I can see it scalloped, but I don't know why it would be. Is it is yeah, it nice. is there a is there a name is there a name? 
that we... I don't know. There's a, there's a clue next to the picture. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Would be described as a data shape. <laughs> 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 if you look at the time and you want to do the curates, because that's all you've got, you can yeah. see that this is a curate that's been brought to you. So it's peaking into later electrical system. Um, you know, if you had a, a peak from aortic or mitral fusion, it will tend to occur earlier unless it's very severe aortic stenosis, in which case the peak may move back later, but it won't have that one same shape. Very nice. Beautiful. So, so this, so what I'm trying to get, um, uh, what I'm trying to get across is that really the Doppler profile. You can sort of almost do a spot diagnosis, and it, you should, if you see something like this, you need to start digging further because this is a continuous wave, right? So, what you need to do is figure out where along your line this this profile is happening, um, and if you when you see this dagger shape. Because it's usually the reverse, right? So, so normally, if you put a, a, a continuum through the LVOT um, or through the through the valve, you'd expect to see a very early peak and then a gradual. It looks like a mirror image of this, essentially. Um, and, but not the such high velocities, though. It also and, be, yes, and not high that. velocities yeah. exactly. So you wouldn't get velocities as high. Um, and so, if you see this sort of reversed. Uh, um, shape or this dagger shape um, then that's just a, a clue to keep to go looking and the other thing is uh, when you put a color box over your left ventricle or your LVOT and you see um, turbulence where there shouldn't be turbulence uh, then that's another clue to go looking as well okay so so this is um, from a paper uh, one of the, the papers that I listed earlier. Uh, so this just ex this is just a, a displaying all the abnormalities of the mitral valve itself. You can get with a classic LVOT obstruction. So and that ranges from uh, so the top two pictures are normal, and then uh, but below that you have a long redundant anterior mitral valve leaflet um, and then on the right side you can see that there's like an extra papillary muscle um, and uh, below that you can see that the papillary muscles might insert directly into the anterior mitral valve leaflet and um, and B in that uh, panel is a redundant posterior mitral valve leaflet um, C is where they're both redundant and essentially, what we're, what I'm what I'm trying to elucidate is uh, what I'm trying to get across is that that there's a various mitral valve. There's a whole host of mitral valve abnormalities that are associated with uh, Hocum, classic Hocum. So it's not just a bit of hypertrophy and then a little bit of um, the, that mitral valve getting stuck in a venturi effect. It's there are actually many mitral valve abnormalities as well. So this is what you talked about earlier, Ray. So maybe I'll shoot back to you and you can tell us what this is. Um, so again, so we're looking at the, uh, the E and A wave. So we're looking at the uh, uh, M mode through uh, uh, the personal long axis view. Um, so uh, I am... So this is the aortic valve. Yeah, hold on, yes. E and A waves, yeah. We're Right. So the, the aortic valve. Aortic valve. Thank you. That, that, that oh, sorry helped. about. Sorry, I should have a picture there as well. So, you That's okay. so this is an M mode through the aortic valve. Aortic valve. Yep. Yep. So we see um, on the left side, the A side is um, normal. Um, I think. Um, I think what's really, happening? I yeah. think because of the obstruction, the blood is going, you know, with the flow. Is a fluttering of the valve, aortic valve. That's a fluttering you can see over here. Right, on the left side, yeah. It's going at a very rapid or very high flow. The, the aortic valve will you know, flutter. That's what you can see. Yeah, and w what else is happening there? So you have the fluttering, and it's. So, w so where where is the aortic valve closing on this picture? It's a bit early. It's, it's early. early closer. Right? Yeah, it's early, right? Because um, you're getting with the SAM, it's eventually getting to the point where it completely obstructs flow. So the, the the gradient there at the point of the SAM to the aortic valve is zero. The aortic valve closes, 
um, and closes early. So that's one of the, that's kind of what you were talking about earlier, Ray, you said they are available, but you have early closure of their well. This is, this is describing that you, you still have some, some turbulent flow there, so you get this fluttering, but it's, um, it's closing considerably early because it's just completely obstructed. Yeah. Um, and then the picture on the right, so B, anybody want to have a, this is, it's a hard one. Does anybody that's want to probably have a, a subaortic membrane. Beautiful. Nice, Ramsey. <laughs> Beautiful. This is a sub subaortic, yeah, exactly. Subaortic obstruction where it opens very briefly and then closes. Sorry, can you explain that second one? Because I didn't understand. So, um, either because there's an obstruction at the subaortic level, you, you get a gradient that's sufficient to open that valve only very briefly at the beginning of the stilly. And then it, it, it drops right off because there's, there's an obstruction and then the, your, um, your force of contraction is not, it's kind of easing off for the rest of Sicily, if that makes sense. So it's like a fixed obstruction versus a dynamic Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, and this is showing the, the similar sort of thing. Uh, it's a nice picture. Yeah, on a, on a toe image, yeah. If okay. we come down, we might have a few other people have joined us, if you just, oh. and there might be an arrow down, yeah. There we go, so we do have oh, a okay. there as well. All right, so, so this is probably what's most relevant in the ICU. So you can get a, dynamic left ventricular output contraction, but without any predisposing physiological, uh, sorry, predisposing anatomical conditions. So um, what are some of the physiological factors that might um, might give us an LVA to uh, Oh, I'll pick on someone. Uh, so Sebastian? Uh, yeah, so, Physiology um, main things are uh, things like uh, your hypovolemic uh, patients, um, which we get to see more and more of in, uh, in critical care, uh, and then also all your uh, all the things that will uh, uh, increase. Um, so uh, so uh, what's it called? Increase your uh, contractions. So uh, stress, pain, um, all those uh, all those things. Um, uh, any uh, potential ion dilators as well, um, so your GTNs and all that sort of stuff. So uh, yeah, those are the main things. Yeah. Good. So yeah, so when you have a very hyperdynamic uh, left ventricle uh, hypervolemia, and then we sort of talked about the right ventricle as well that can um, that impinge on the LV cavity. Uh, you can also get it. Um, this was news to me. You can get it in a, a takotsubo if mm. you have a have a vigorous contraction of the basal segments of the LV. So the apex might be, won't be doing anything, but then the the, the 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 very vigorous compensatory contraction from the basal segments might give you um, a gradient. Um, and then you sort of talked about other physiological things, but sepsis, um, balloon pumps will increase your risk of of uh, getting a gradient um, and then also post MI. So if you have, um, again, preserved contraction of your basal segments, you can get a compensatory rigorous hyperdynamic um, contraction at that level and that can cause um, a gradient there as well. Uh, anything that, that um, decreases afterload and preload and increases contractility and heart rate really. Okay, so. Uh, so this is just demonstrating the process that you go looking for a dynamic um, obstruction. So I just want to bring your attention to the, so the, that first panel on the top left is showing you uh, how you kind of start quite deep within the LV cavity so that you don't miss anything. So you start there and then, so that's A. A looks like this panel A. Then B is here, this is panel B, and then C is right at the LVOT. So that's so that's what a normal, this is a normal, this is normal what a normal trace should look like. Okay. So what's happening here? Maybe I'll pick on 
Lewis. Hi. Um, sorry, what was the question? My internet's a bit unstable. Uh, what's happening here? What's happening? Uh, so this, yep. So it looks like a, um, a continuous wave trace through uh, the LVOT thereabouts. Yep. And there is a, um, there's a fairly high velocity with, uh, we talked about the dagger, the dagger shape yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. before. So I'd be suspicious of an LVOT um, obstruction. The, I want to look at the other, uh, the other levels to see whether it's, um, whether it's uh, sub aortic and, and how, uh, how far down is the LV cavity that the gradient is. Great. Okay. And then one more for you, Lewis. What's this? Oh. Um, so this is a pulse, pulse, if you can't see that top box very well, it's a pulse wave and it's sort of like no. mid, mid is that cavity. Mid ventricle? Mid yeah, ventricle. okay. Yeah. So that's a, I think that's a kissing ventricles, it's a collapse of a, um, it's the uh, ventricles, um, compressing and touching themselves and are completely obstructing the uh, the outflow tract at that point, giving yeah. you a, uh, a spectral Doppler that's sort of cut out. Very nice. Excellent. Did you watch the, the Twitter video? <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> My internet's not working very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good, because this, this is on there and this has a name as well. Does anybody know what the name of this pattern is? Um, no. So this is the lobster claw pattern. Okay. <laughs> so it's kind of like if you can, it's, it's a lobster claw going down that way. So, um, yeah, so basically you get this mid, um, uh, systolic, pretty much mid systolic drop in your output. And this is from, uh, obstruction that happens in, within the cavity, cap, within the left ventricle. So it's an intracavitary gradient within the left ventricle that gives you this, again, it's an LVOT uh, obstruction of physiology, but it's not at the level of the LVOTs within the um, cavity. And you can get that with um, the, the same physiological conditions that we talked about or a mid ventricular hypertrophy. Um, and you can also get it when you have um, an apical hypertrophy and then they've developed an apical aneurysm so sometimes with this apical hypertrophy, they, they get an outpouching of the, of the apex as well. And then um, you get this sort of pattern. And basically what it is, is um, once that's, that, that flow has stopped in Sicily, then when you, you're getting into diastole, there's still actually a, f a forward flow within the LV chamber itself. So, so this sort of, um, this big, part of the lobster claw is a, is a diastolic forward flow in through the chamber from the, it might be from the, from the, from the LV apex or from that apical aneurysm. Um, uh, and it just continues to flow out towards the LVOT. Am I explaining that okay? Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, so I thought that was cool. Yeah. Uh, so we might just- You can see that on the ECG too. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Um, excellent. So is that, is that all making sense? Yeah. Um, so we'll um, might jump over to the other side and do some cases. Yeah. Deceleration time is the normal is 160 to 200. And in the example we did where I was trying to show you something out of keeping with the grade two diastolic function, that, that person actually had a deceleration time of 160. So it was actually spot on because it had pseudo normalized as well. All right, so can you all see the echo here? Yes. Great, okay, so yes. who, should, who should we pick on? I think it back up to Ramsey on him. 
<laughs> or is it Ramsey or is it uh, have we? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, so. Is it me? Yeah, it's you, Ramsey. Okay, oh, I... so. So, well, yeah, you... of course, this is a Palestine long axis view um, and uh, very nicely demonstrating quite a, uh, a hypertrophied uh, septum um, and sigmoid shaped as well. Um, um, it's probably a slightly off axis, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, the papillary muscle being seen there. Um, yeah. Okay. But however, yep. said that um, you could still see um, the subvalvular apparatus attached to the anterior mitral leaflet is actually getting um, coming into the left ventricular outflow tract in systole. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, um, I, I would be quite suspicious of a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction in this particular one. Um, yeah. So I'm just slowing it down so we can all see that. Yep. Are you saying that? And what what else is remarkable about? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know if you mentioned this. What what else the, is remarkable about the, the cavity size itself? And the, yeah. So the cavity size is, uh, appears uh, small. Um, very small. It is very small. Yes. It's almost even even the mid cavity is like completely. Uh, both the walls are completely touching each other in systole. Uh, exactly. So the end, end systolic dimensions are pretty low, as well as the end diastolic dimensions are low. Perfect. And I'll show you a. So what do you what do you think of that? All right. So again, the uh, cavity is completely collapsing. Um, there is definitely um, end diastolic di um, dimensions of the left ventricle are very sm small. The wall thickness is uh, severely increased. Uh, obviously, we'll have to measure that to uh, quantitate that. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is at the level of the papillary muscles. You can see the papillary muscles again uh, touching, um, so uh, kissing left ventricle basically. Beautiful, yeah. So this is called the kissing ventricle something, which yeah. Um, so probably some profound hypo hypovolemia here. Um, and you're right, there is hypertrophy here, definitely. With the measurements, just take it with a grain of salt because they're gonna look. Uh, they're going to appear to be thicker than they are because um, at, end, at end diastole, when we take the measurements, they're not actually properly being, um, they're not properly relaxing because there's not enough, because um, the cavity size is so small because they're so hypovolemic. So you might get a, a pseudo hypertrophy. High, yeah, nice. a sort of um, measurement. And, and that comes up in the exam quite a lot. I, I think it's important to mention if someone's hypovolemic. And you think there's thick walls, mention the pseudo hypertrophy. It's another little tip and trick, I think, that puts the examiner at ease if you say that if you're seeing the kissing ventricle sign. Nice. Okay, so. Okay, so what do we think of the color? This is so this is the apical five chamber. Maybe I'll pick on someone else. Uh, oh, yeah, you can't do it. I can't do it here. here. Oh, okay. So, Lewis, can you unmute yourself? I'm going to pick on Lewis you. Lewis McLean, that is. Lewis McLean, yep. <laughs> yep. So, there's, so, it's an apical five chamber with, um, with colored Doppler, and there's flow acceleration at the level of the, uh, the basal septum. And, and where, and oh. I'll, I'll throw it down. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've got a three-year-old here with me. Um, maybe a bit of regurg as well. There, there's no age limit to DDU teaching. She can start whenever she wants. Where she's more than welcome. <laughs> They're intrigued. <laughs> maybe, maybe some aortic regurg there as well. It's a little bit. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, do you think yeah. there's some acceleration uh, maybe elsewhere in the LV as well? Some aliases? Oh, yeah, so mid ventricle. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> beautiful. Well, it was a team effort. <laughs> <laughs> You can actually see the obstruction in the mid ventricle happening quite late in systole. 
yes, yes. So yeah, there's this there's this aliasing here, isn't there? Yeah. Um, uh, okay, great. Okay, so now we put. Let me see if this is right. Yeah. Okay. So we we put a, a continuous wave down there, and pretty high velocities, but the shape looks okay. Um, let me see if I can. Okay, so so now we've gone hunting. Um, we've gone hunting for because um, we saw that we saw that aliasing in the mid ventricle. Now we're going hunting for where that actually is. So who are we up to? Uh, Lewis Campbell, do you want to tell um, yourself? Tell me, tell me what you see here. So this looks a similar view to before. It looks maybe like a five chamber, just from the uh, the brightness yep. of the base septum. Uh, yep. The pulsed wave Doppler signal is at the LV apex and is demonstrating that lobster claw with um, mid-systolic um, flow ablation. Um, yep. the, the absolute velocities aren't very high at that stage, um, and it might be because of obstruction from the kissing ventricle and then um, and then refilling as the ventricle begins to relax. So it may not be that there's ejection but redistribution within the ventricle and late systole. Yeah um, yeah so exactly so this is uh, what we saw before this is that sort of lobster core sign. Um, excellent Lewis and then what so we, we're moving our pulse wave Doppler more and more towards the LVOT as we saw in the example on the slides and we're getting this and then I'll give you a couple more. There you go. So what level would you describe this obstruction? Um, so the most obvious obstruction was probably mid cavity. Um, this is just past basal set. This is mm, that's just before the uh, is at the junction of the mid to basal septum. Yeah, uh, and it's, it's probably most severe in the mid cavity, or has the 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 highest velocity and most obviously late peaking in the mid cavity? Yeah, I think so, because once you get out towards the LVOT, that trace starts to look pretty normal. Um, this is mid cavity again. So, so this is out in the LVOT, and then we're getting a little bit deeper um, with this one, a little bit <clears throat> deeper, and then we get, get that lobster claw um, further towards the apex. So yeah, I think this is, so I would call this a mid, uh, mid ventricular intracavitary gradient um, causing a, a, a dynamic obstruction to uh, outflow tract obstruction. Um, okay, and then we'll just do one, one, one more case. So yeah, so that that patient was uh, <laughs> just so you have some clinical background. That patient was very old and uh, very very dry with a completely collapsing IVC, um, very small ventricles, um, and uh, and also had aortic stenosis on top of that. So I rang the GP and I was like, I don't know how she's still walking, but. You probably, you probably need to call her in. Um, so, okay, so it's not a super great quality image, sorry, it's a bit grainy. Um, maybe, who are we up to? Sebastian, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, tell me what you see here? Yep, yeah, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, this is a parasternal uh, long axis and uh, yeah, within the limits of what I, what I can see. Um, uh, I'm looking at what I think is a 
thick and uh, thick and septum, um, uh, which yeah, which is slightly mm -hmm. hypertrophy. And they also think that there might be um, uh, an element of uh, rheumatic uh, heart disease uh, affecting the mitral valve. Those uh, those tips of the mitral valve appear quite thickened um, on this view. Uh, also, within, again, within the limits of a 2D image, uh, it does look like that anterior leaflet is uh, uh, has a very low sort of E point separation at the top there, and it looks like it's abutting that um, uh, that septum during systole. Um, yeah, so those are main. Slide it down, so. oh, thank you. Yep. Yeah. So you think that that that, that mitral valve might be sort of hockey stick shaped? Exactly. Um, Okay, possibly. Um, yeah, so you're getting um, some sand there, right? We can see in the in the short axis some LVH that you mentioned, uh, and then we've got I think we've got a zoom in of uh, not not great quality images. I apologise. So this is a zoomed view of the mitral valve, um, just again showing some sand in the systole, the uh, sort of anterior motion in systole. Um, Okay, and then have I picked? Have I picked on everyone? Is there anyone I haven't picked on? Raymond. 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 Okay. Raymond. Raymond, I will give you something in a minute. Okay, Raymond, tell me about this one. So this is a continuous wave Doppler through a five chamber view, apical five chamber view, and we're seeing. Um, an increase in the gradient. Um, it, I noticed that the shape does look uh, late peaking um, and um, is, is a dagger shaped. Uh, the mean gradient is not listed there, but the uh, peak, peak velocities are high. Yeah, higher than you'd expect, right? Mm. Uh, let's see if we could, no, we don't. Have, yeah, we don't have a mean, so yeah. So it's quite high, high. Um, so it's probably. A better one. So on this one, yeah, quite high velocities oh, as well. Sorry. I've got to come, I've got to uh, duck off. Oh, I've finished. There's no, 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 no sorry, sorry. Sorry. I thought you were just waiting for me. Oh, right. Sorry, uh, my, my hour's over. Okay. All right. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. No worries. We'll just be one or one or two more minutes and then we're done. Thanks, Ray. Okay. So who should we pick on? Sam. Oh, well, Vishal. Oh, Vishal. Oh, yeah, Vishal. Vishal, tell me about um, tell me about this this trace. So this is the pulse wave uh, at the LVOT level, and first thing we need to optimize the trace. I think you know the scale could be optimized better because yeah. we can't see the the you know the whole trace. Yep. And Maybe I get a better one. There we go. Yeah. Oh, that's a little bit further in. No, no, you've just got that one. So the scale <laughs> is optimized. No, so I can't see that tip below. Totally, there. exactly. And why is that? Because probably it's, you know, the pressures are so high. Yeah. So, so sometimes you need to do the continuous wave to see the LV or Fantastic. Yeah. So, and, and that's exactly right. So, why is it going off the end? The, there's a buzzword I need for the exam to tick the box. What's happening here? What was this an example of? Failure. So, yep. Uh, and why, why is it going off the end? Because I can't, if I make the scale any bigger, I will get a ghost artifact yep. in there uh, where you see the two gates that come in. So I won't be able to pick it up. So what's, what's so it's going off the end. That is an example of trying to avoid yeah. aliasing. So that, that is an optimized picture. And mm -hmm. it's just an example of high gradients that can't yeah. be, you, you are unable to tell me how much the, the speed is going because it's in pulse wave doctrine is limited yeah. by physics. So sometimes, you know, we see in the severe MR as well where E wave is too high, more than 1.3, 1.4, then you put the Fantastic. Yeah, continuous. Yeah. Okay, good. And then, uh, so this is, this is the pulse wave is just jumping back into the LV a little bit here. And then a little bit more here. And the screen Okay, 
so I'm just trying to find a good one. So where do you think the the level of the obstruction is in this in this case? So I think it's at the level L B O T. Yeah. Because I didn't see, you know, the whole going up to the cavity to be honest. Uh, so so this is going up. Yeah. Any further up? So probably I think it's at the level of LBOT. I, yeah, I think I think so. I think also we saw the SAM as well. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to find. It. Yeah, we don't have a we don't have a. But yes, you should. You will. It would be nice to see that the they at that sort of true mid ventricular and apex of yeah. the that you're not getting a, a late peaking curve. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, good. And I think that's pr that's probably everything. Great. Um, well, listen. Can I say a huge thank you to Benny for uh, doing the teaching? Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. Were there any just last minute qu questions for Benny? In that case, uh, I'll say thanks very much, guys. We'll see you. Uh, I think it's next week. We're taking probably a bit of a break. It's Christmas, isn't it? Next week. So we'll see you in January. I'll send out the email and we'll go from there. Thank you very much, guys. Thank thanks, you. everyone.